Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. I'm uh, Chris Capaldo, the rector here at St. Chrysostom's Episcopal Church in Quincy. And thank you for joining us for the Interchurch Council Good Friday service. A special thanks for QA TV for recording and editing this service. A thank you for all of those pastors and people who have gathered together today and given of their time to be here. And now I invite you to join with us as we enter with joy upon contemplation of those mighty acts whereby our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has given us life and immortality.
Would you join with me in our opening litany from Isaiah 53? Let's read responsively. My servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be lifted high. There were there were many who were astonished at the sight of him. Kings shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire. He was despised and rejected, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. He bore our infirmities and carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him with the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not complain. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, it was like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away, stricken for the transgression of the people, that made his grave with the wicked, although he had done nothing violence, and there was no seat in his mouth. Yet it is the will of the Lord. Out of his anguish we are saved. The righteous one shall make me righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of the many and brought salvation to the world in his death. Our gathering hymn today is number 474 in the blue hymnal, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
You may be seated. The first word comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Rant to me about religion, and I'll listen. There's this campus pastor in Nebraska whom I recently read about, who for the last 10 years has held outdoor office hours. Often when he sat in the courtyard of his campus and saw people trying to minister to students, mainly he heard people ranting at them, calling out epithets and threatening people with damnation. So the campus pastor asked, what if I did the reverse? Which led him to week after week taking two folding chairs and a chalkboard sign that read, rant to me about religion and I'll listen. And he planted himself under a tree in the middle of camp the campus courtyard. Instead of ranting himself, he would be the listener. He would listen to other people's rants. Listening to people's stories and frustrations, their experiences of religion and faith that had been disappointing or maybe even traumatic to them. Over the years, he's had countless conversations with students who were raised in the Christian faith but had found it inhospitable to their doubts, and their questions. Or he'd hear how students felt that Christianity had played a, war, uh, played a role in warfare, or sexism, or racism, or fill-in-the-blankism. He also recounts the numerous in-depth dialogues with international students and students of other faith traditions that have had positive and hurtful encounters with Christianity in America. He was looking for honest conversation. In some ways, he saw this as a form of resistance, providing a counterpoint to the chaos or an alternative to what he had experienced. Today is one of the rare days in the church where we're invited to join in that form of resistance. We are invited to pull our metaphorical folding chairs and our metaphorical makeshift signs that say, rant to me about religion, and sit in the busyness of the world where most people don't even know that it's Good Friday, and take a seat. And just like I said, you know, the, the folding chairs are metaphorical and that chalkboard is metaphorical. I don't actually think that people are going to rant to us today. Although, maybe. What I do know is that we hear the crucifixion story. And today is one of the rare days in the church where we open ourselves up to the ways in which we are complicit in that crucifixion story. We acknowledge our complicity in the ways we have hurt and wounded the world. And we let those hard truths soak in. And let's be honest, it can be a very vulnerable thing, and even somewhat painful, to hear the ways in which we might need forgiveness for those hurtful things. Hurtful things that we may not even know that we've done sometimes. Today is not a day to be defensive and try and talk our way out of the why it's not our fault or why we're really good people or why we just didn't know. Rather, today is a day that we just sit in our folding chair and we listen. We listen to the ways in which we are like the Roman soldiers, how we are like the crowd that yelled, crucify him, crucify him. 
and how we are like those religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross. And maybe how we're even like some of those people that those students rant about. And then we also listen to the promise that Jesus gives us. Not only for those people 2,000 years ago, but for us today. We hear the promise of God's grace and forgiveness. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Behold the life-giving cross on which we hung the Savior of the world. Reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, beginning in verse 25. Pontius Pilate freed Barabbas, who had been put in prison for rioting and murdering, because that's what they wanted. But he let them do what they wanted to Jesus. And as the soldiers led Jesus away, they grabbed a man named Simon, who was from the city of Cyrene in Libya. Simon was coming into Jerusalem, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd followed Jesus. The women in the crowd cried and sang funeral songs for him. Jesus turned to them and said, You women of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Rather, cry for yourselves and your children. The time is coming when people will say, Blessed are the women who couldn't get pregnant, who couldn't give birth, and who couldn't nurse a child. Then people will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. If people do this to a green tree, what will, what will happen to a dry one? Two others who were criminals were led away to be executed with Jesus. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him. The criminals were also crucified, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Meanwhile, the soldiers divided his clothes among themselves by throwing dice. The people stood there watching, but the rulers were making sarcastic remarks. They said, he saved others. If he's the Messiah that God has chosen, let him save himself. The soldiers also made fun of him. They would go up to him, offer him some vinegar, and say, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. A written notice was placed above Jesus' head. It said, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging there insulted Jesus by saying, So you're really the Messiah, are you? Well, save yourself and us too. But the other criminal scolded him. Don't you fear God at all? Can't you see that you're condemned in the same way that he is? Our punishment is fair. We're getting what we deserve, but this man, he's done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me 
when you enter into your kingdom, Jesus said to him, I can guarantee you this truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Have you ever been in a place when you really, truly felt like you needed God to make a miracle? When perhaps like the thief in our passage, you can't imagine that there is a way out. How can we hear and answer God's call when rescue seems unimaginable? First, God's call penetrates any darkness. Two thieves have been crucified with Jesus. I'm not sure I can think of a bleaker future for someone than being nailed to a cross. No one gets down from a cross alive. And yet one of these dying thieves hears Jesus' prayer, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And one thief sees Jesus' response to the sneering of the Pharisees and the mocking of the soldiers, and he is touched by it, moved by it. One thief recognizes both his own failures and Jesus' goodness. Even in this darkest time for him, this thief perceives the greatness of Jesus and understands that Jesus has saving power. God's call can penetrate even the darkest times. Second, answering God's call transforms the heart. Or is it that God transforms the heart so we can answer his call? During the 1970s, my dad pastored a church in Hollywood, California. His young adult group had serious issues. There was a barefoot hippie who dabbled in magic, a runaway prostitute, and I could just keep going. What was extraordinary about that group was not what they were when they came, but how they left. The barefoot hippie broke down in tears one night and began a journey with the Lord and Savior crucified and risen for him. And the runaway prostitute finally realized that every time that she ran, God had been chasing her. When she stopped and turned to greet the hound of heaven, she found that Jesus could take all of her fears and her pain and fill her with grace instead. And the redeemed hippie and the faith-filled prostitute got married. <laughs> and they're still living godly lives. Why am I telling you this? Because I know that if God can transform the hearts of these two and a convicted thief on a cross, I just know he can get a hold of your heart and mine and break us free to make us new. The more we answer God's call, the more clearly we can hear God's voice. Answering God's call transforms our hearts. And finally, the way through is God's way, not necessarily ours. When we face the darkness and we need a miracle, we often want the miracle to come on our terms, don't we? 
We pray not for God's will to be done, but for God to do our will. We pray not according to God's purpose, but for our own good, our own happiness or ease. Whatever the darkness, God provides a way through, but it may not be our way. The thief did not leave the cross, neither did Jesus. But on that cross, the thief found a Savior and his heart was changed. And on that cross, Jesus prayed for forgiveness and offered up his life to God's way. Sometimes the miracle is that God walks with us in the darkness. Sometimes the miracle is discovering that when we hurt, Jesus shares our pain. God always provides a way for us, and God will walk with us in it. So what about you and me? When rescue seems unimaginable, when will we find ourselves scoffing like the self-righteous, mocking like the hard-hearted soldiers, or cursing like the unrepentant thief? When rescue seems unimaginable, do we just write God off? When we are feeling lonely and facing the darkness ahead, do we believe the bullies? Or do we believe our Lord who made us and died for us? You see, I think we often sell God short. Believing in God is a fine thing, we might say to ourselves, but not when things get real. Believing in God is good, but let's face facts. The fact is that even when rescue seems unimaginable, God's call penetrates the darkness. The darkest, the bleakest of times. And draws us in and transforms us. When rescue seems unimaginable, God comes in and helps us answer with the same kind of forgiveness and grace, our Lord and Master, the crucified King of the Jews, has shown us. The promise is that when we walk according to God's purposes, that God will be at work in and through us. Indeed, when we live and love as Jesus has shown us, the promise is that others will see Christ in us and give God the glory. The promise is that by God's grace, Christ's love and the Spirit's leading, we will become the miracles God has always intended us to become. Rescue may seem unimaginable, but so is the greatest, the greatness, and the power of God's love on the cross. Behold, the life-giving cross and Savior of the world. My reading is from John 19, beginning at verse 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. 
also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. Woman, he said, woman. Even as his clothing was gambled away and he was trapped on the cross in the agonies of crucifixion, he spoke a message of love to his mother, calling her woman. Woman. He said, woman, Behold your son. And in the same context of looking up to behold her son Jesus on the cross, Mary also looks to behold the disciple as Jesus instructs that disciple, Behold your mother. Does it mean this disciple must now try to live up to being a son like Jesus? What shoes to fill? Don't you know that painful feeling as a child that you just cannot measure up to your sibling? Or the dread feeling that you can never quite be the good child for your mother that some other child manages to be for that lucky mother over there. But Mary is not thinking of how her new son compares to Jesus, child of God without flaw. She hears Jesus speak words of life and love into the agonies of the greatest pain she has ever known, standing at the foot of his cross. Jesus calls on her to see that her own life and love go on, to be honored and cared for by one who stands by her to cherish her as mother. Jesus calls on her to see past the trauma of the day, to be held in, living, in loving relation by one who will take her home and take care of her as if she were the very woman who gave birth to them in the first place. You know, Jesus names people to be family with one another. Even during the hours of his crucifixion, Jesus was not too preoccupied to notice someone else's needs and speak a loving response into the situation. And while we ourselves cannot be flawless without sin as Jesus was, we can still do our best to follow in his footsteps. We can notice the members of our community as members of our extended family and honor them as they face certain days which they are not sure how they will make it through. 
Let us cherish one another as parents and ch children, united by Jesus on the cross. And let us learn to see one another as God sees us. Beloved, and in humbleness before the cross. Behold the life-giving cross on which we hung the Savior of the world. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I was younger, younger than I am now, <laughs> these words of Christ perplexed me. They made me uncomfortable. Why would Christ, God incarnate, made manifest, feel forsaken. W was he not God? That's sort of the thing. But as I have gotten a bit older, and experienced the changes and chances and sufferings of this life, that line, that verse, has resonated with me increasingly until, to be honest with all of you, it's one of my favorites in the scripture. I feel as though I can say that we come from a multitude of sources and parishes as Christians gathered. We believe that Christ is fully God and fully human. And if fully human, then he was fully capable of experiencing all the range of emotions that we are of delving into the depths of human experience and their array of joys and sadness, of pain and dejection. That in the readings we go through, we follow this day, Christ, by exposing himself to the worst of what we as sinful human beings can do to other people. And we can do some horrible things. Christ identified himself with all who have experienced unimaginable pain and cruelty at the hands of others. All who have suffered and been cast out by false piety and religiosity. Those who have been slandered. Those unjustly imprisoned and condemned. Those who suffer greatly undeservedly. And with those who feel completely separated and abandoned by God. Christ did that. So that if we ever experience that pain, and some of us will, 
or have. If we ever feel forsaken by God, we know that He did too. This year has carried great pain for many of us. We all have our own stories to tell. And in our stories with God, some of them contain times of pain, of grief, with ourselves, with society, with the wider world. But there is great comfort, I feel, in a God who has been there with us. And hope and assurance of a better tomorrow. That is a hope that we all possess. Humanity through the worst of our nature, what we can do to someone, the worst of our hate at God. God, however, hates nothing that he has made and forgives the sins of all those who are penitent. God has nothing for us but love. A love for us so powerful that he chose to save us by not saving himself. For even with all the evil capable by humanity, it pales in comparison to the love capable by God. That is a great lesson I feel this day holds. That though there will always be pain, cruelty, and death, in this journey of our lives and with Christ, at the end of both there will always be forgiveness, love, and resurrection. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross on which we have the Savior of the world. I'm reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of, full of sour wine was standing there, so he put, they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Perhaps you have waited at the bedside of a loved one who is dying. Perhaps you have wiped their sweaty brow with a clean, cool, damp cloth. Perhaps you have applied lip balm to chapped lips, and you have massaged dry hands with lotion. Perhaps you have slipped ice chips into a parched mouth as they draw their raspy breath. And you have whispered, it's okay. You can let go. You can rest now. We'll be okay. We've got this. Jesus does not die on clean sheets with loved ones who are within reach to minister to his needs. This is not a bedside, but an execution on a cross, the Roman Empire's instrument of torture. There are no clean cloths to wipe Jesus' face streaked with sweat and blood. There are no ice chips to slip into his parched mouth. And to add insult to injury, there is not even fresh water 
only a sponge soaked in sour wine that is raised high to his mouth on a wobbly branch of hyssop. No wonder Jesus is thirsty. He has been flogged. He has been held in prison all night long. He has been dragged from Jerusalem to this hill. Doubtless, his interrogators did not offer him a drink. There are women at the scene, Jesus' mother, Mary, his Aunt Mary, and his disciple, Mary Magdalene. They are witnesses who have stayed along with the unnamed beloved disciple. The others have run away in fear of the authorities. Only this handful of disciples have the courage to remain and witness Jesus' suffering. We would have stayed, wouldn't we? The women and the beloved disciple experience the agony of watching their loved one die without being able to offer any comforts. Jesus has taken on this suffering and in their compassion, the women and the beloved disciple take it on too. We would have taken on his suffering too wouldn't we? From the beginning of John's Gospel, Jesus' identity as the Word of God has been revealed. Throughout this story, Jesus has lived in the world as God would live in the world. And now he dies in the world as God would die, taking on all the pain and suffering of humanity. In his last breath, Jesus takes one more opportunity to take on that pain and suffering. The suffering of children whose faucets only offer polluted and lead-laden water. The suffering of immigrants and refugees who walk for days through arid borderlands in search of safety. Of prisoners who thirst for the living water of human compassion of those who live in the war-torn cities of Ukraine, cut off from food, water, and a sense of peace and stability. Or even the suffering of all of us as we hunger and thirst for something better. Connection, acceptance, community, and peace. We would have stayed at the cross, wouldn't we? And if we had the power to slip ice chips and wipe Jesus' sweaty, blood-streaked brow and feed his thirsty mouth, we would have done it, wouldn't we? We would have whispered, it's okay, you can let go, you can rest now, we've got this, wouldn't we? Behold, the life-giving cross. On which she hung the Savior of the world. Our reading is from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, the 30th verse. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished, said the master woodworker, wiping off the sawdust eyes running over their masterpiece, the finest work they've ever made. It is finished, said the writer, making sure to hit save on the computer before closing out the document, their novel finally completed after years of stopping and starting and stopping and starting. It is finished, said the surgeon, taking great care in stitching that final suture, knowing this patient had waited and waited for treatment, forced to wait 
until it was nearly too late for the procedure to work. It is finished, said Jesus from the cross, his words rasping against the unnatural stillness surrounding the three dying men on that hill called Golgotha, a stillness of waiting, a stillness of watching, the kind of stillness that knows that something somehow is ending and is about to begin. It is finished, Jesus says from the cross, but to whom is he speaking? Is he talking to himself like the woodworker and the author, admitting that he can do no more? His work is over. His masterpiece completed, and he saved who he could while walking the dusty roads surrounding Galilee. It is finished, Jesus says from the cross, but to whom is he speaking? Is he speaking to the beloved disciple, to the courageous women standing at the foot of the cross, like the surgeon talking to the surgical team, letting everyone know his part is done, and now it's time for the others to come forward to do what is needed to literally wrap things up. It is finished, Jesus said from the cross, but to whom is he speaking? Is he telling the soldiers and the authorities, the mockers, the fearful and the haters that it is finished, but leaving them to wonder and worry what exactly it is? It is finished, Jesus said from the cross, but to whom is he speaking? Is he calling out to God, letting God know that he, Jesus, understands his role as Jesus of Nazareth has been fulfilled? It is finished, Jesus said from the cross, but to whom is he speaking? Is Jesus speaking to us, the ones still milling about, anxious and confused, uncertain where to stand? Not sure where to work. Not sure how to respond. Not sure what will happen. Is Jesus whispering to us, it is finished, to remind us once again that his earthly ministry had to end so the promised miracle could happen? It is finished, Jesus said from the cross, and honestly, no one is certain what Jesus means. No one is really knows what it is, and that's okay, because that is exactly the point. What it means can be all of the above. It can be everything and anything, because it will mean different things to different people. Yes, Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus' human life is finished, but then so too must everything and anything, all of the things and that keep us from the life-giving, outrageous love of God. What is in our lives that must be finished, Jesus asks, so we can begin anew? What is it in the lives of others that must be finished, Jesus asked, so they can truly live and live anew? What is it in the world that must be finished, Jesus asks, so the world can live into the hope and promise of the resurrection? How will we know what must be finished? What is it for us? We must ask ourselves, as with m as much honesty as we can muster, what is it that weighs heavily upon me when I look at the cross? What is it that causes me pain when I look at the cross? What is it that angers me when I look at the cross? Let it go, Jesus tells us, tells you, and tells me. Let it all go because, as Jesus says, it is finished. It is finished, Jesus said from the cross, his words rasping against the unnatural stillness surrounding the three dying men on that hill called Golgotha, 
a stillness of waiting, a stillness of watching, the kind of stillness that knows that something somehow is ending and is finally about to begin. Behold the life-giving cross on which we hung the Savior of the world. A reading from Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 44 through 56. The death of Jesus. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light fell and the curtains of the temple was torn into two. Then Jesus crying with a loud voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what has been taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw that has been taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintance, including the women who has followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The burial of Jesus. Now, there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, has not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Aramitha, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a rod and tomb where no one has been ever laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who has came with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rest according to the commandments. The final word on the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is the same word from Psalm 31. Into God's hands I command my spirit. Jesus is not only speaking on behalf as the Son of God. Jesus also speaking on behalf of humankind for every one of us. This word command in New Testament the meaning also can be mean trust or to commit. So we can read, Father, into your hands I trust my spirit. As an ordained minister for the past decade, at the funeral service or at the burial site, an ordained minister will say the prayer like this. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we command your servant, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own, a lamb of your flock. In 2022, we especially pray for those who die in the war zone, in pandemic, natural disaster, illness, gun violence, and more you can name it. But this is the final prayer of Jesus on the cross. We trust and commend those lives in Christ 
into your hands, O merciful Savior. Behold the life giving cross. And now, together, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature, and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering, and may also share in his resurrection, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. And now we will sing hymn 172, Were You There? Found in your blue hymnals. Please stand.
Thank you. 